for questions. Fire away, Fab. The question I wanted to ask is, um, like I said to you outside, I've been inspired by you guys for, for a few years, three years now. But there's, you know, I get my moments where I get feel like I've got a desire for God and feel moments that I don't have desire for God. And yeah. you know, sometimes it goes a week, two weeks where I don't even think about God. And sometimes it's an intense week when I do. Yeah. Just want to know, like, how I can, why, you know, is it just about fear that I don't have that desire or is it? Is it no, bit... it's not just about fear. No. Um, obviously, fear plays a part in desire. So every time you have fear, it suppresses desire, certainly. But, but desire is not just about fear. You see, you see, there are people in the sixth fear of the spirit world who have no desire for God. No desire to have a personal relationship with God. Now, they don't have much fear. They have no fear that affects their love of other people at all. Um, they obviously do have some fears about God, but they don't have fears related to other people. Um, they have perfected their natural love, the love that comes out of them towards others and the love that they, they allow other people to love them, but they still haven't developed a desire for God. So, and the first human couple didn't have a desire for God. And yet they were completely without fear, actually, when they were created. So they had no fear at all. And they still didn't develop a desire for God. So developing desire is not just about your injuries. Right? And this is something we need to understand about our emotional self. That just because if you don't have a desire for something, it's not just because you have an injury. It's because also you don't have a desire of some kind. That, and desire is something that has to be developed. You know, you, you, you never start something generally without there being a spark of something. But, but you generally don't do anything about it until that spark sort of develops into a flame and then develops into a furnace, you know, that fires everything that you do. And that's the same with your desire for God. So, so there was, there's a couple of things that I would look at. Firstly, I'd look at my fears. Like every time you have a desire for God, as you know, you have quite emotional week when you have a desire for God. And maybe there are some fears associated with you having an, a week that's emotional like that and feeling like if every week was like that, it might be a bit overwhelming. And so there's a tendency to shut down. But... but I, and sure, there are I'm times not able when to function too, you know. Yeah, you think in that you're... week, um, I can't sing, I can't do much. It's so there's some of your fears. Right? Yeah. Some of your fears are that you're not going to be able to continue your normal day to day life if every week is like this, and so that obviously is fear that's stopping a desire for God. But to be honest, I feel a lot of the stuff about desire for God is just a lack of desire. For God, like a, a lack of desire to know God and to understand God and to understand the importance of the relationship with God and all these other things. Because I, I don't feel, when I have a week where I'm like really focused, and, and I usually have months, not weeks, where I'm really focused on God, and I don't feel like I can't do anything else. I feel like I can do everything else better. So, so that, you know, would tend to indicate that if you're having a feeling like it's shutting yourself down from doing other things, then maybe you know, there are quite a lot of fears that are being confronted every time you have a desire for God. But my suggestion is, um, firstly, work your way through what fears are preventing your desire for God. And in fact, I would focus on those fears. That, to me, they are the first fears that are worth developing, worth working your way through. Like, so, so the average person on this planet can list 20, 30, 50, 100 fears. If they are honest with themselves, they possibly could list thousands of their own fears. But very few of us ever list fears relating to God, right? So we don't focus very much of our attention on the relationship. The relationship isn't our first priority. And if, you, if you're honest with yourself, your relationship with Laura is your first priority. Before God, yes. Yeah, before yeah. God. Yeah. And, and obviously that means that if something comes up in your relationship with Laura, your relationship with God is put on the back burner, right? If your relationship with God was your first priority, then your relationship with Laura would be second priority. 
And, and that means that if something happened in your relationship with Laura, it wouldn't interfere with your relationship with God. You would still want to develop your relationship with God. Does that make sense? So one of the things we need to look at is our priorities. So when we're looking at the aspect of desire, developing desire, and this is something that will help you with some of that homework I gave you about you know, finding and developing desire, how do you go about finding and developing desire. Part of developing desire is about your internal priorities. What, what are your current priorities? If we're honest with ourselves, most of us would have to say our current priorities uh, you know, for some, it's about avoiding fear every day. That's their priority. For some, it's about getting their addictions met every day. That's their priority. They don't even have a priority with their relationship with their partner. As long as the, they get their addictions met, it doesn't really matter if they're a partner or somebody else who meets them. It doesn't really matter to them, right? That's, so a lot of times, our, even our relationship with our partner is quite low down on our priority list, if we have a partner at all, Right? And, of course, all of you have a partner, just some of you are not with them at the moment, right? Because your partner is your other half, your soulmate. That is your partner. You're just not with them at the moment. You're not aware of them. You're not conscious of them. But, but a lot of the times you don't even care about that. You know, that's another priority that's on, down on the list. And, and often what we need to do is readjust our priorities if we're ever going to develop relationships. So if you're going to develop your relationship with God, one of the things we're going to need to do is adjust our priority system as to what's the most important relationship. Right? So, so from my perspective, my most important relationships are God, my soul, which includes my soulmate, right? because that's, she's, she's one half of my soul. So it automatically must include her. Right? So that's my next priority, the soul, my soul, my own. Then, so, that my, so mine, which is not just me, but also the other half of me. And then the souls of others is the next relationship that I would like to develop. So soul, others. So not my children. They're not my children. I've got, you know, two sons, but they're not my children. They are God's children. So they are just as important, but not more or less important to me than any other person on this planet. Does that make sense? So I want to develop a relationship with them just as much as I want to develop a relationship with any of you. Right. Can you see... If you place your priorities, now, now of course you've got other things happening down here in your priority list. You know, if you're honest with yourself, you, you might have 30, 50 things, 100 things even. You might finish up with, you know, what are the things you love doing and all that all goes on the list. But what I find is that most people don't have that as their first three priorities. The majority of people have one, num priority number one, avoidance of pain. Priority number two, Meeting of addictions. Priority number three, enjoying your life. Now, I don't know how you're going to do that with the first two priorities in play, but that's what we finish up doing. We try to think we think we can enjoy our lives while we avoid all pain and meet our addictions. But, but that, that's not possible, of course, but that's why we often have an unhappy life. But... Those first three things generally are the average person's and the average person on this planet has those first three priorities, which are completely different than those priorities. Now, in order to swap our priority systems over, we need to recognise firstly that we have a priority and what that priority is, and then we need to recognise that that is obviously out of harmony with the happiness in our soul. That's why we have unhappiness, is because our priority systems are out of harmony with God's love and laws. So we'd be better off bringing our priority systems in harmony with God, into harmony with God's love and laws. And once we recognise the importance of that, we start to adjust our priorities. So, so for like, as I said, the average person's priority system is avoid pain, Get my addictions met, right? And then enjoy life. 
Five. Right. Usually the first three priorities in the average person doesn't even involve another person, aside from how that person can meet their addictions and how that person can help them avoid pain and how that person can help them enjoy life. That's why most relationships break down very rapidly as soon as one problem comes up. You know, like, for example, the average male on this planet, if he doesn't get sex for a month, he's already almost breaking up with his partner because his priority systems are all about these things, right? And none of those things are getting met properly, and so, right? He doesn't get to avoid pain while his partner is avoiding him. He doesn't get to have his addiction for sex met, and he doesn't get to enjoy his life because most of his life revolves around the fact that a, a woman is showing him attention sexually. And so he's willing to discard that woman and just get another one who does those things, Right? So he can say he loves that woman, but the reality is his love of that woman is way down on the list. Because if your love of that woman was way up on the list, you wouldn't avoid your own pain. You wouldn't you know, want your addictions met with her. You wouldn't uh, focus on enjoyment of life. You'd be focused on sorting out the relationship between yourself and her so that you can have a happy relationship rather than a codependent one. Yeah. Mary, you wanted to say with that? Well, just equally, if you were the woman in that relationship, yep. you would, if you really uh, had the priority... This is number one, two, yeah, yeah. number two, then you wouldn't avoid sex for a month in order to avoid pain, meet your addictions and enjoy your life more. Exactly. You yeah. wouldn't do that. You just couldn't do it, right? Because you know straight away that there's something going on, there's something wrong, there's something interfering. What is it? You'd want to know. You, you wouldn't do things like that. So to, the majority of us do have to be very honest with ourselves about our priorities. Most of our priorities are very narcissistic and selfish. They are, they are not involved around our relationship with God, our relationship with our soul you know, and the other half of our soul or the love of our, or, or care that we have for others, but rather they are evol revolving around those three things that are, that are our real priority. Now, while those things maintain, are maintained as a priority, you're going to find a developing relationship with God quite difficult. And you're going to find it wax and wanes. You know, you, you, whenever one of these things comes up, whenever, whenever anything that's more important than God comes up, you will abandon God for that thing. So if your fear is more important than God, you'll abandon God and you'll embrace your fear. When you say embrace it, you'll live in it. If, you, you know, if your avoidance of pain is your primary priority, whenever that comes up in your relationship with God, you'll just abandon God and avoid the pain. That's what you'll do. Whenever your addictions come up and they get confronted in your relationship with God, if your priority is to get your addictions met above your relationship with God, then of course you'll go for your addiction and forget about God for a while. This is why we often forget about God in our daily life. When you really desire somebody, you don't forget about them. You don't ever forget about them. You think about it. You don't, do you? You, if you, you remember the times you're really, really in love? Right? Can you remember a time during the day when you didn't think about them? It's, not, it's completely opposite, isn't it? When you're really, really in love, you think about the person all the time. When you really love somebody, that's what you do. You do do that. But most of us don't do that with God, right? For lots of reasons, you know. There's, like I said, there's literally thousands of reasons why a person may not or be challenged by the, their relationship with God or may not want a relationship with God. There's lots and lots of reasons that are potentially the reason why. But if you're truly going to progress on the divine love path, as we call it, or as people call it, the way that, that God designed to progress, if you're going to progress on the way, you are going to need to firstly have as your primary priority your relationship with God. Right? And, and, and when you don't, you will find you'll abandon God every time something else of more importance in your life comes up. So what I would, look, what I would do personally with that issue that you've raised is I would look back over the times when I had like a, a developing relationship with God where I felt there was some connection with God in that week. And then what I would do is I'd look at what happened the following week and see 
how, what that tells me about my current priorities. That what happened the following week? What it might have happened was that, you know, you had a bit of a uh, disagreement with Laura and the relationship was a bit topsy-turvy and that interfered with your relationship with God. Might be that. Or it might be that, you know, you had some gigs come up, you know, some music gigs come up and, you know, because of the gigs and your engagement with the gigs, you forgot about your relationship with God. Or it might be that some issues come up with the family, you know, with your daughter or someone, and, the, and then during that process you forgot about your relationship with God. Now, every time you forgot about your relationship with God, that tells you what your priorities are that are higher than your priority to be with God. Yeah, and I was looking at that, and I was like, and I, and I started doing that already, yep. this analysing when I lost my focus for God. Yeah. And as it's been growing over the years, yep. but it's like, you know, I have this moment with this time with God and then it disappears because something does come yep. up. Yep. And then I avoid that emotion for one, two weeks until God keeps, and I know inside that God's showing me. Yep. So it gets to a point where it becomes so much that I need to start to connect to the emotion yep. and God and then it gets cleared again and then I've got this relationship with God again. But it's yep. like I get frustrated because I have this feeling that I know that that's the process but it could be easier. True. But if you think about it, God wants the relationship with you more than you want the relationship with God. That's true, yeah. And that applies to all of us. <clears throat> God wants the relationship with me more than I want my relationship with God. And that's, that will forever be the truth, right? So if no relationship is actually occurring, it's always to do with something going on internally, always. Now, it can only be two things. One is that we are, you know, lacking desire, real desire. And, or, and two is that we're in the process of a lot of fear. It's got to be one of those two things. So, so all we can do is focus. So, so if it's fear, then yes, there are certain fears, and you know them. You know, you know when things are not so smooth between each other. There's fear that comes up when you've got some issues with your children. Like there's fears that come up. You know that those fears in particular seem to interfere a lot with your relationship with God. So you know there is a relationship between those fears and your priority system. Those fears are telling you your priority system actually. They're telling you the truth about your priorities. And, and I feel at times you're not willing to see the truth about the priority. Yeah. Right? You want to tell yourself that, no, you really do have a desire for a relationship yeah, no, with I don't, God. I know I don't have yep. that full relationship with God. Yeah, when, when there are other things in your priority list. So, so you know, when something happens with your daughter, yeah. you know that you get very distressed. Yeah, yeah. Right? Generally yeah. you do. Yeah. Now, you, you know during that time... You've got you 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 think less about God. You you, you barely think about God at all. So you know that there's something in your relationship with your daughter that 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 is causing an emotion inside of you. you know, it's about understanding yourself emotionally. There's something that causes an emotion in you in that moment that causes you to abandon God and focus on your relationship with your daughter. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for, and you've got to find out what that is. Yeah. Now God's already trying to tell you what it is. And the fact that you don't know means that you're not open to knowing. Well, with my daughter, things have moved a lot in that area because I went through a lot of those processes that you're talking about yesterday. Correct. Yeah. Now it's more about what's happening with us. Still with a woman, though. Exactly. Yeah. So yes. something's gone off my daughter, and now onto Laura. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I'm still not willing to see my mum's part in it all. Yep. But also not willing to see your own addiction in it all. Yeah, and that's more the point. Yeah, you, you, you. There, there are two sides to everything that's going on in your current relationship. You remember, as I said yesterday, if we just, uh, I'd probably like to leave that there. Actually, um, yesterday, remember, I drew. Uh, I said there were two types of relationship: forgiveness relationship, repentance relationships. Right. So here's you. Here's your relationship with Laura, your partner. So there's that relationship. That's a relationship where you need to repent because you created an addiction with Laura that you want to met. Any problems that you have with Laura are all about your addictions and her addictions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, they all come from your refusal to forgive your mother. Right? Yeah. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, your refusal to forgive your mother creates a, a, a fear in you of, and therefore an addiction. When you refuse to forgive your mother, the only reason why you would refuse is you're afraid of something, right? You're afraid of some grief or you're afraid, you're afraid of crying about some issue relating to your mother, right? And what that does, it, it, you then have fear associated. That's the only reason why you'd not cry because you have some fear associated with it. And then you create the addiction with your mum. You try to do it with your mum first, but that doesn't work because she's the one who's caused the actual pain. So what you do is you establish a relationship with another person which will feed... Will, yeah, that's the addiction relationship. That's the relationship you need to repent for. So when there's problems between yourself and Laura, you, the first thing you focus on is, what is it going on inside of me? What, what have I created here with Laura that I want met? That, that is because I feel pained if I don't get it met. Right? That's, that's what I need to focus on here. Now, whatever that is causes me, here's my relationship with God, causes me to abandon my relationship with God. So it's very important to work it out because anything that it causes you to abandon your relationship with God needs to be focused on as your highest priority. Right? So there's something that's going on where you want something from Laura that causes you to abandon your relationship with God. There's something addictively going on there. Right? And that's what's causing your relationship with God to be put aside for a period of time while you try to resolve whatever is going on here. Now, God's been trying to show you what it is, and the law of attraction has been trying to show you what it is, and you're resistive to it. Because if you weren't resistive, you'd already know what it is. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. So you need to honour the fact that you're resistive to it, mm -hmm. honour the fact there's got to be a fair bit of fear associated here, and then focus on praying about that issue. What, what is the fear? Why is it that I'm now abandoning God for the sake of this relationship? What's really going on for me? And that will help you work out what it is that's causing the fear side of the relationship to be affected. But the desire part of the relationship, while it is impacted by fear, can exist right? Same time. at the same time. And what I'm suggesting is desire is all about getting to know someone, wanting to know them, wanting to spend time with them. So, so why don't you want to spend time with God and you'd rather spend time with Laura? Because I can't get my addictions met by God. True, you can't. Yeah. But what other reasons might there be? Well, because I can talk to Laura and I can yes. have her talk back to me. Okay, so you get to hear Laura yeah. without you needing to be in the development where you're open to her Absolute. emotions. Yeah. So that would be an addiction as well, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Like wanting to be able to hear somebody without feeling them. Yeah. So, so you see, you can hear God, but only when you feel God. Yeah. So, so, so this indicates that you want a relationship without having to feel some them. Does that make sense? Yeah, you want yeah. a relationship with Laura, but you want to be able to not feel sometimes yeah. the relationship with Laura, but still have the appearance that you're having one. Now, you won't be able to have that kind of relationship with God. No. With God, you either feel it or you don't, and if you don't, there's no relationship. <laughs> yeah, enough. Yep. Noticed. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 can you see also another reason why it might happen? Whenever there is no relationship and God's showing you there's something wrong, there's a feeling of wanting to hook into other people around you yeah. as a way of avoiding the pain of not having the relationship with God. Yeah. So that's also. So, in other words, you're using substitution methods yeah. to avoid relationship with God. These are, these, are, these are, I'm just giving you a list of what potentially yeah. it could be yeah, a lot of them rather than on. doing all your investigative work for you. And, yeah. you know. No, yeah, I yep. understand. So you, you can see that there's two sides to it. One part is addressing the fears. So there's obviously some fears that develop when this relationship, something wrong with this relationship happens that cause you to abandon your relationship with God. But on the other side, there's something with regard to desire that causes you to focus your primary focus onto this relationship rather than your relationship with God. Mm. And my suggestion is to examine both directions mm. rather than just looking at one or the other. And the things that could be affecting desire are that you want a face-to-face -face interaction mm. because you can't feel a non-face-to-face -face interaction. That could be one thing. Yeah. Or you want an addiction met. And with God, you're not going to get your addictions met. Most of the time I feel it's that one. Yep. Yeah. And for most people, it is that one quite frequently. But also it can be things like 
desire? Do I, have I learnt enough about God to develop a desire to want to know God more? In other words, are you reading enough about God, thinking enough about God, feeling enough about God to even develop a desire to know God? See, what helps me a lot there is to read material like the Paget Messages or you know the Robert James Lee's material, other material like that, that helps me feel my relationship with God again, right? Rather than focusing my attention on something else that's more distracting. Yeah, yeah. I get my guides tell me sometimes to read stuff or you know put a yep. certain thing that you've put on YouTube to watch that to get yep. me feeling about God again. Yep. So yep. it's just that I, I just want to be able to do it without having them tell me most of the time. But Yeah, this is another injury, though, that you yeah. have is that you, you do want to go it alone a lot. And to be honest with you, nobody has. Mm-hmm. Even I haven't. The difference between myself and you is I've gone, God's always shown me where to go next. So I'm not going to be able right. to get it from God if I want to do it on my own either. No, that's right. It's like God is, God's, this is the thing. We've got to be humble enough to recognise that there is... God has provided to us people who can assist us in our relationship with God. And every time you go, oh, but I want to do it myself, you're not honouring the fact that God provided you somebody who did it first. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And that's to do with what? What, what? What's that emotion? Arrogance. Yeah, basically, mm-hmm. isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's a feeling that you wanted to be the pers- person who was first, but mm-hmm. you weren't the person... Got selected to be first. <laughs> so, so there is some emotion there that's obviously interfering with your ability to receive help from your spirit friends and from other people who might be able to assist you. Yeah. So, so allow yourself to see that. You, you see there's quite a number of different things that it could be affecting this mm-hmm. desire that God's showing you there's, something issue, there's an issue there. At some point, each one of you is going to have to go through the emotion, and it will be an emotion, that, that there is a person who God did select to be the first person. Right? I've had to go through it, even though it was me. And you are going to have to go through it too. But you will have a different slant on it than I did, in that you, you will have maybe some anger in that well, it wasn't you. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't have that. I just had fear that it was me. <laughs> and I had other things that I had to work through about it being me. me right? But, but these are emotions that you are going to have to go through. Um, and everyone will have to go through them at some point. So, so you need to honour what God has established to be the method of helping you. Mm. And you could say in some ways that's, you're not honouring that. No, I'm not. No. I'm not, yeah. So... So that's it's something. Funny sometimes, and it's not. Yeah. Sometimes, but it's but other times, often, yeah. no. Other times, there's this feeling in you of, of independence. Yeah. Is probably the best way of putting it. Yeah. And uh, and that that feeling of independence, is part partly a, something that interferes with your relationship with God. Yeah. And yeah. I feel that's there more than those times that I feel connected to God. Like. Yeah. I feel softer with those those. Correct. Things, you know. So. Yeah. When you have the relationship with God, you will feel softer. You will feel more in connection. You'll also honour the gifts that God has given you to help you progress. Yeah, it's, like a big, it's like two different kind of worlds at the same time. Oh, they, no, they don't have it at the same time. It's no. just two different no. worlds. You know? They are two different worlds, yeah. yeah. So what I'm trying to point out, I suppose, Fab, is the, all the different factors that may be interfering with these two areas. So the two areas, in, in summary, are fear. Have a look at your fears. Obviously, there's fears with regard to your relationship where when the relationship starts going a bit topsy-turvy, then interferes with your relationship with God. So obviously, that's telling you that your priority system internally is out of harmony with the best way to progress towards God. Mm. Uh, The best way to progress towards God is to have God as your first priority, right? And then there's the issue of desire and what are you doing to develop this desire? And that's... To me, that's like associating with other people who have the desire, associating with other people who know about God, who want to talk about God, who want to spend time feeling about God. A lot of the people you associate with don't want to do that. No. If you think about almost everybody you meet in your day-to-day life, there's very, very few people. There's only a couple that I can ever talk to God about. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. And that's because of my desire, isn't? Partly. Yeah. But it's also partly because of these other pressures that you have. And partly because the priority system is out of whack, mm. whereas almost every day 
myself and Mary, are talking to each other or someone else about God and God's nature and God's character and God's feelings and God's all of those different things, right? Mm. Um, mind you, you can do it by yourself, but, but you would also have to then have time alone where you can think about God, feel about mm. God and so forth. So are you giving yourself that time alone mm. to develop this desire inside of you for this relationship? So that, that are the two things I would focus on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, to to work through, and your fears tell will dictate to you your priorities. Yeah. They will. Every time you're afraid of something and you honour that fear, you've now put that fear above everything else in your life, mm. uh, and you've got to see that and reverse that somehow. Mm. Yeah. If you're willing to feel your fear rather than act upon it, then you won't do that. Mm. So you can still have fear. It's just how you treat your fear, how you act, you know, what you do with it. Yeah, it's like it has to ramp right up before I even go there. And yeah. Then, and then I eventually go there, but it's, it's like... It but has it has to, to be intense. Intense. Yeah. And God wants you to be more sensitive than that. Mm. Right? So God's trying, trying, to help you say, trying to help you be really sensitive that it only takes a little bit. Mm. But to be, to be frank, I find this, I have the same difficulties, particularly coming from, uh, in a, from the condition of error and... From my perspective, coming from the condition of low worth is very, very different a process going towards God than coming from the condition where you have worth. Right. So, in the end, the biggest emotions you will have to address is your own sense of your own, of your own worth. Mm. Yep. And they will be the biggest impediments to your progress. Yep. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Sis, you wanted to ask. <laughs> I just realised um, a little more clearly last night how my own judgement is just a, a huge block yep. in front of me. Yeah. Um, and all I could do was get through to some pain and just a little flash with God this morning, but clearly I'm, it's taking me more time to break down this resistance. Yep. Um, Can I, I talk a bit about judgement? Thank you. Is that all right? Um, and then maybe you might want to still remember your question. <laughs> Let's uh, look at what's driving judgment, shall we? What, if we see, if we're going to understand our emotional self, we're going to have to, at some point, understand what's really going on in to, inside of ourselves, right? And that means becoming sensitive to what the, the flow of emotion within ourselves and what stops it. So, so you could say that the emotion, whatever the emotion is that you're feeling, starts to flow, right? So before it starts to flow, it's just energy that's locked up inside of you, energy, locked up inside of you. Once it's in motion, it becomes an emotion, something that is now passing through you. Now, once this emotion starts passing through you, what happens next? What happens internally next is the question, right? Now, when you judge, what happens? The emotion starts flowing, and what, 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 what's the feeling that comes up prior to judgment? Let yourself feel your judgments. <laughs> like, don't, don't just jump out with the answers. Just feel what, what, what happens inside of yourself. Right? Your emotion's flowing. You're starting to cry. You're starting to have tears come down your face, let's say. Or you're starting to shake. Or you're starting to, you know, actually... Feel the, the energy in motion inside of yourself, and then what happens? So, Matt, if we can start there with the mic. Well, to start with, my desire to feel that feeling just, just like goes down very quickly. It does, but why? There's got to be something that makes it go down, isn't there? Can you see that? Yep, Laura? Um, for me, it's a belief, a belief system. Okay, I agree. It's a belief of some kind. So there's a belief of some kind. And now, all beliefs are emotional, right? They're all emotions. All right, so what's happening, Mel? Um, I think for me, it's, and I'm not always conscious of it, but it's a lack of desire to choose something different. Yeah, but there's got... If you intellectually know that if you chose to go and feel this emotion that something is going to improve in your life, but emotionally you don't know that, 
which is what we're really saying, isn't it? Because if emotionally we knew it, we would do it. So the fact is we're not doing it, so emotionally we don't know that it's actually beneficial. So there's got to be something going on. We've got one emotion flowing. So let's say it's the emotion of grief that starts to flow, that's now starting to flow. Now there's got to be something else happening to stop the flow of that emotion. It's got to be an emotion in itself, doesn't it? Does that agree? So, Matt? Matt? I'm just thinking on my own experience. A lot of the time I'll start having a thought of what someone else would think. Okay, so what's that? Fear, judgment. Fear. It's fear, fear, of, fear what, of them. Them. Fear of them. What yeah. are they going to do with what I feel? What are, yeah. what are they going to think about what I'm feeling? What are they going to do after, the, after I feel in front of them? What are they going to do? Mm. So can you see the emotion of grief is flowing? Mm. And so this belief is causing an emotion of? Fear. Fear. Okay. All right, so the emotion starts flowing. The belief cuts it off. Right through the flow of the emotion of fear now. So what, what's the thing we need to do to write this problem? We've now got fear. What do we do? It's an emotion. So we allow the flow of the fear. Right? That's what we need to do. Right? If you do not do that, you will accept the belief. Right? the belief will become true to you. As soon as that belief becomes true, you are now shutting down the emotion because that belief says you've got to. The belief says you've got to shut down the emotion. So what is the main problem? You are not willing to feel fear when you go judgmental. So judgmental emotions are all about fears. They're all about what you're afraid of. Mary? And then... Trina? So what I experience is, or what I don't experience, <laughs> is the, um, I begin to feel an emotion mm -hmm. and then I'm aware that I have a fear of how my parents, feeling how my parents judge that emotion. Yep. And I don't want to feel it so I judge myself in the way that they would have judged me and it stops everything. Yep. So That's why, why don't you want to feel their judgment? Yeah, I'm afraid of the pain, the pain that I suppressed as a result of their judgment. Correct. The only reason why we don't allow fear to flow is because in the end, we don't like to experience pain. Because okay. everything is going to be related to pain. The biggest problem that we have in the world we live in is that nobody wants to feel their pain. Most of you don't want to do it even in your relationship. That's why you're blaming the other person all the time. Right? Oh, but they did this and oh, but they did that. No. Oh, but they did this. and It's because we don't want to feel our pain. We want to blame our pain on something else. What caused all of the emotional suppression in our soul? How? How did our parents cause our emotional suppression in our soul? No, no, no. You think about it. What did they do to themselves? We have mic. Suppress their emotions. They suppress their own pain. That's what they did. Right? The choice that you make to suppress your pain is exactly the same choice that your parents made to suppress their pain, which created all of your pain. When I say all, no, half of your pain would be more accurate. You know where the other half came from? From yourself doing what? Unloving acts. Unloving acts. Right? That's the reason. They're the two only causes of pain. There's only those two causes of pain in there. So every time you choose to avoid pain, whatever justification you have for it, you are choosing to harm 
someone else. Right there and then. Every single time. Right? And that's exactly what your parents did to you. So, can you see that our honour, the real problem, the real problem with all of our processing work is our honour, the honour we give to fear. And the resistance we have towards pain. Now, the two only problems we have processing all of our emotions. We honour fear and we resist pain. If you could develop somehow within yourself a desire to feel pain, that would be pretty powerful because then all of your resistance to your pain would re be removed. And if you could also develop within yourself a feeling that you would no longer honour fear, you will no longer value fear over anything else, now both of the impediments to your processing emotion, your going through emotion, would be gone. Now, how much easier is that going to make your life? Heaps easier. If you want to progress towards God, you'll be able to feel an emotion. The fear might come up, the belief might start kicking in, but you don't honour it. You don't honour it emotionally anymore. Right? Instead, you just feel the fear that you have, another emotion. You just let it pass through you, the fear. And any pain associated with that fear might come up. There'll be grief under it and stuff. You'll let yourself feel that. And then you'll be back to feeling the original emotion. It'll just be like a small little detour and back to feeling the original emotion. Now, we've been doing a whole series of FAQs about emotions. In the second session, I think it is, we talk about what are the primary problems associated with feeling emotion. We mention the resistance to pain and the honour of fear are those primary problems that everyone's facing. Um, when the emotion starts to flow and the belief system kicks in, mm -hmm. um, for me it feels like um, a, a cap that is almost like a, a betrayal of myself for a promise that I made in my childhood not to See feel. now, see what you do with a lot of your emotions. There's no way known you made promises to yourself in your childhood. Do you Did know I? why? No. Because you didn't have a developed enough mind to do so or developed enough moral state to do so. This is stuff that New Age spirits just feed you with crap. Uh, I, I, sorry, I mean in the sense of like if a teacher hit me in the classroom, I'd say don't cry, don't like, don't cry. Like. That's not a promise to yourself. Um, That's a response of fear. That's a feeling. It's not a promise. It's a feeling of fear. You're afraid of crying because you might have violence. That's all it is. Okay. You, th you want to view it as a promise to yourself so that you can distance yourself from what it is emotionally. What it is emotionally is fear of somebody violently hurting you. It's fear of pain. <laughs> That's all it is. There's nothing more complicated than that. So when, when, with, with the cap, how do you get to the flow of an emotion what, when the cap just... Cut? What's the cap? So the cap is, it feels like a, 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 a the, uh, so that's fear, that numbness. Uh, yes, it's fear. It's not the promise you made to yourself. It's, it's not a little, I thought fear might be shake. It, it's just not, it just goes like. It's fear and you don't want to feel the fear. And that's the problem. That's where it all begins. You don't want to feel it. And you can call it promise to yourself, but it's not a promise to yourself. It's more like a, a strong use of my will not to feel. This. No. 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 You were taught that every time you felt whatever that original emotion was, that you were going to be violently abused, pain, and you don't want to feel pain. You're afraid of pain. That's where all of your blockages are. There's no such thing as promises you made to yourself. They're just things that happened as a result of our desire to, know, to avoid pain. The, the, you could call it the beast part of ourselves, the human 
part of ourselves, not our soul, but the, the, you know, the physical part of ourselves, has a pain, physical pain response to certain things. And, and we need to develop a desire to feel it. Right now, most of you are sitting down and you have no idea what pain you're in. Right? And, and the reason why is because we've desensitized ourselves to feeling our pain. We, we don't want to feel our pain. That is our primary problem. What, if you, as a child, wanted to feel your pain, no matter how much pain came along, you would never have made what you call a promise, which I call fear, be the ascendant thing that controlled your emotion. You would have allowed the emotion to continue. But that's pretty hard for a child to do because it doesn't have a developed intellect, it doesn't have developed emotions, and it doesn't have developed moral morality until it's like well into its usually, you know, above seven or, or, or much greater than that. And as a result, anything that happened before then is going to be tainted with all these murky areas of morality, emotion, feelings, pain and avoidance that have all it's been taught to have. So give yourself a break. It is just fear of pain. So, Everything yeah. you call a promise is fear of pain. So I, th I, I, would, I used to veer off with the belief system, which just takes me further away from... Yes, you want, to do, that way. you want to do that. Because yeah. you know what doing that does? Well, it takes me the, away the from going The more you down. use your mind to go off and oh, analyse the belief system, think about the belief system, what is this belief system, uh, I promise I made to myself and all these other things, the more you do that, what are you doing? You're I'm using your intellect to avoid the fear... Feeling, that's all you're doing. Yeah, I, I, I am. Yeah, I felt that I was working through belief systems. No, I'm you're not. using your intellect to do exactly what you want to do at your soul level, which is avoid fear. Mm, which is my priority. Which is your priority, yes. And you need to see that as your priority. You go, okay, yeah, a lot of my life is all based around avoiding fear. A lot of my life is all based around pain. And, and when I say based around pain, based around your fear of pain. You see, if you could let yourself feel pain, then you wouldn't be afraid of it anymore. Right? But most of us are so afraid of it, we can't even let ourselves feel it. And, and this is our problem. We, because we're afraid of our pain and we don't want to feel our pain and we don't want to feel our fear, what we do is we search for other solutions. Yeah? Know what I mean by that? Uh, totally. You do that all the time, <laughs> all the time. right? So you know what I mean by that. You search for other solutions, and if that means analysing my belief systems and thinking about this and working out my law of attraction events and working out all these other things, that's where I go because all of that does, all that does is help me avoid the feeling of fear. So that's my addiction. That's the addiction. That's the addiction in play. So you think you're doing something that's beneficial to yourself, and it's very I think counter. I'm working through my belief systems. Yeah, no, you're so not. That's how the belief system can only be worked through by feeling the fear. <laughs> that's the that's the irony. Does that make sense? That's the irony of all this. The the only way that your belief system is going to change is by you feeling your fear. And, and when we go and intellectually analyse the belief system, work on the belief system, all those things, which are all responses to avoiding our fear, we are not feeling our fear. And the only thing that is going to help truth enter our soul, right, on that same subject, is by releasing the fear that exists on that subject in our soul. That's the only thing that's going to help the shift. The, the, the soul has to release one thing in order for the other thing to come into it. Right? And when you're analysing your belief and doing all those things, there's no release of anything going on. And because there's no release of anything going on, there is no hope of the truth entering you on that subject. And the truth can't enter you on the subject until the fear has been released. The error, remember fear is error, needing to be released. And without the error being released, the truth cannot enter. The emotion will not flow. And while that happens, it doesn't matter how much intellectual work you do, how much study you have, how much listening you do, how much talking you do, anything, 
It's all driven by the avoidance of the fear. It's all a way, a method that we have to avoid the feeling of the actual emotion we need to feel, which would actually heal us if we allowed ourselves to feel it. And this is where we do many counterintuitive things. We think that analysing it all, working it all out, thinking about our belief systems, and all, all of your belief systems are not thoughts. All of them. They are all feelings that are false and error-based and therefore there will be fear associated with every single one of them. Every one of them is a feeling. Right? Not a single one of them is a thought. They produce thoughts, but they're all feelings. So unless one of those feelings exits your soul by you feeling it, by you experiencing it, by you going through the emotion of it, the truth on that same thing can't enter your soul. And so while we go around on this intellectual route, examining all of the different possibilities and potentials, philosophizing and reasoning and discussing and all of that, we're actually not aware that we're doing all of that in order to avoid the one thing that will actually help us. All right. Now, you, a person like yourself, who has been treated quite badly as a child, Laura, are going to have lots of ways of doing this. That's the hard part. The hard part is deconstructing the ways and methods that you have to avoid the feeling of it. Well, it's already scary to think that I'm really running out of addictions. Like, the, there's the, of all the, the physical, like, you know. But yep. it's actually a scary place to now really know that, wow, to write my belief systems, to feel about my belief systems is another addiction and an avoidance. Correct. Yeah, so what we do initially when we look at our addictions is we look at the physical ones, right? Which are all to do with substances, abuses like, you know, food, alcohol, you know, drugs, um, pills, tele, tele, sex, all those kind of things. And all of those, of course, are driven by all of our emotional addictions, right? Right? And those emotional addictions, what created the avoidance of our emotional addictions, what created our physical addictions. The thing about physical addictions is they are um, the fail-safe, uh, if I can use that word. What I mean by that is that whenever we have a physical addiction that's met through a physical substance, we don't have to rely on a person. And that's great because people are unreliable, right? Whereas substances are reliable. You get the same. Like, how many of you ladies know chocolate is the best way to feel good for a short period of time? Yeah? Well, you do know that. Like, that's why you take it, right? So you know that's the solution every time. So that's why you want the chocolate. Because, so it, it's more reliable than your husband or your wife or your family or your friends in making you feel good for a short period of time. Right? That's the thing about physical addictions is the substances are more reliable than the people. But once we get rid of the substances, the substance-based addictions, we're left with these emotional addictions, which are all about people, what you do and what you can get from people in order to avoid your fear of your pain. Right? Right? Now, many of the things we do emotionally are all driven by this desire to avoid our pain. So this desire for you to analyse intellectually everything about your belief systems rather than feel what your belief systems are is actually an emotional addiction that helps you avoid pain. There's a little person inside of you who learnt at a very young age that if you could do all this intellectual gymnastics, right, you'd get away from the fear. And it would make you feel like you're in control. And it's almost like when I hear you speak and, and, and then, you know, like look at the belief systems, then I take that but use it as a way, uh, the way that I want to use it. Many people are doing this. So many people hear, like when I talk, you know, somebody asks me about their emotions and I tell the person exactly what their emotions are, they go, oh, AJ analysed that person. No, I didn't. I've never analysed a person in my entire life. Do you know what I do? I feel the person. <laughs> And all I do is I tell back to them what I feel from them. That's all I do. All right? But the average person doesn't see it that way. You know what they see it as? 
and an analysis, an intellectual process that I go through, which I don't go through, by the way. Right? An intellectual process of analysis. And so they go, oh, AJ does that, so that's what I'll do. I'll do that with all of my emotions. I'll analyse them all, go through them all, you know, check off the boxes and all that kind of stuff. Well, I'm sure people have put that before priority of God. Like they think that they're getting closer to God, but their prior- it's all based on a fear of trying to sort the, their, or their addiction, whatever yeah. it is, but yeah. all that's an avoidance. Yeah, I don't do that. I don't do any of that. Right? But, but because I can feel what a person feels it and be quite accurate with it pretty much all the time, a per- generally people think that that's what I'm doing. But that's only because that's what you do. <laughs> you know, we often judge another person on what they does, ba- on what they do, based on what we would do in the same circumstance or situation. And the reality is, yes, a lot of people, most people, in fact, when it comes to dealing with emotions, analyse them. But analy- analysing your emotion is a mental activity that is usually undertaken to avoid the emotion. And if we're not honest about the desire to avoid the emotion. We're not honest about why all this intellectual activity is now going on. And it's all going on because I'm wanting to avoid the feeling, the feeling of fear that has now come up in me. And the fear is always about being afraid of pain. And a lot of people say, well, what about if I'm afraid of pleasure? No, at some point in your past, if, if, you have been afraid, if you're afraid of pressure, pleasure now, then at some point in your past, that thing was painful. Had to have been. Right? So, for example, a, a, a woman who's afraid of sex, she says, but that's pleasure. No, for many women, that's not pleasure at all. That's pain because it reminds them of things that have happened to them in their childhood with their dad or their granddad or, you know, with other people. And it's painful. It's painful. Right? Not pleasure. It's pain. And so that's why they don't want to feel it. That's the fear. Right? Yeah. Yep. So just because it might be pleasurable now, because, we're, because everything is through the filter of the emotion of what happened in the past, unless it's gone from the past, mm-hmm. you're going to think it's painful. So many women, for example, feel it's painful to be involved in sexual activity. Well, I know for myself, when I'm happy, my mum was very jealous and I was so happiness is... So it, happiness, there's a pain associated really, with yeah. happiness. So it's not the happiness that causes your pain, it's the fact of your mum's projection of rage and jealousy that you're unwilling to feel that causes your pain. Do you see? You see, the, the pleasure-based emotions, there had to have been some pain associated with them in the past for us to be so afraid of them. Yeah. Now, if we, under, if we understand all of that from an emotional perspective about what's going on in our soul, then we'll see that our primary problem that we have is whenever we go intellectual, it's because we're using it as a technique to avoid the feeling of emotion. And it's a very powerful technique. That's why many people use it, right? You know? Of course, many people use other techniques too. You know, Go and get the addiction met. That, that avoids the emotion. It avoids the pain, right? Deny everything. You get to deny all the pain then. Of course, you get to deny all your pleasure as well and a lot of other things, but a lot of other truth gets denied and everything else gets shut down, but, you know, who cares about that? All we're worried about is shutting down the pain, right? And this is where our focus has become distorted. We've become distorted in that we want to shut down our pain when the reality is we need to learn to love our pain, accept it and move through it and release it. That, that needs to be our focus. And, and um, learning how to develop a desire to feel um, like you're going into the very place you don't want to go. So it's a, it's, it's a desire to go into a place. Yeah, well, you won't go there while you feel you, you don't want to go there. The reality is you won't. You, you need to let go of the emotion that causes you to feel you don't want to go there. And that is, a, again, an emotional process. Fear is always the reason why you don't want to go there. So, so you see, what I see people doing over and over again is they ask me question and question and question about their emotions, about their emotions, about their emotions. And in the end, there's almost one answer, well, two, actually, answers, but one primary answer is fear. You don't want to feel it. <laughs> Because if you wanted to feel that, you'd be able to feel everything else. 
That's the main answer. There's only one other answer, is desire, a lack of it. There are the only two reasons why we don't do anything. Does that make sense? We either have a lack of desire or we are terrified. Thanks, Catherine. Don't we get to a stage um, where there's nothing we can do to actually stop the emotion? Of course. If yes, it, it, it's just... It, it's not an automatic place, it. though, Catherine. It's not an automatic place. There had to have been some things that you've stopped doing before you reached that place. You see, it's like we can't assume that... Like, I know people in the spirit world who have been there for 20,000 years, still in, in lots of darkness and pain, and they have no desire to work through their emotion and also no desire to feel their pain. Now, why has it taken them 20,000 years? Well, fear and they don't want to do it. Okay, so there's these two aspects of fear, they don't want to do it. So, so they haven't, through 20,000 years of life, got to the point where it's automatically coming out of them. But the pain becomes so great, there's nothing else you can do but go into the emotion. I agree. If you have a desire to go into the emotion... And that's a big if. Uh, there's people whose pains are so great and they still have no desire to go into emotion, so they hold that place. And while they hold that place, they hold that place, they hold that place. Many of you are doing that right now, so you can't say that it won't happen in the future. You hold that place, hold that place, hold that You use your will. You, are, you have a very strong desire to use your will to avoid the feeling of pain and avoid the feeling of fear. And while that will is exercised in that direction, you will not feel it. It doesn't matter how much pain you have. Mm, I, I just kind of find, you know, the older you get, the more pa pain, <coughs> yeah. the more pain that you have, yeah. physical and yeah. emotional. Yeah. That there's, yeah. That, that you get to a point where you've submitted to it. Yes. But a lot of people don't. I mean, it doesn't happen all the time, but it does build up. But yeah, but a lot of people don't. See, a lot of people in your position, what would they be doing? They'd go to a doctor, get as many pills as they possibly can, get some drugs that they can do to tune away from the pain, make, calm down the fear, calm down the depression, calm down the whatever it is that they're feeling, and they end up, you know, what, what do you notice what, for most people on the planet in the Western world at the moment with, with regard to them being 70 or 80? They've got like a whole drawer of pills, Right? that they pop for all sorts of things. Why is all of that happening? It's because they have a fear of pain, right? Popping all of those things. And they can stay in that state now on earth because they've got all this extra assistance. But in the spirit world, you know, you can feed your addictions forever if you wanted to, if you choose to. It all depends on your choice. So this is where your will to make a different choice is so important. Exercising your will to make a different choice. You have exercised your will partially, partially that's exactly to make right. a different choice. Not fully yet, no, because you're still contemplating the possibility of maybe going to some medical solution or whatever. Yes. yes. So you have not yet exercised your will fully in that direction, but you've made it partially. You... Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, the average person doesn't do that. On earth, doesn't even make a partial choice. There is just no choice in their mind. Avoid pain at all costs, get some physical way of doing that or some emotional way of doing that and focus on those things and only do that for the rest of my life. That's the way the average person thinks. This is why we have this dominant feeling on the planet of forget about the past. It doesn't help you going back to the past. Right? It doesn't help you to analyse your emo to feel your emotions. It doesn't help you. Don't even try it. Take a pill instead. Right? Why is all of that? That is a huge, if you think about it, almost everybody you probably know thinks that way. Why? Because no one wants to face the fear of their pain. And the way the world is going to change is by having a lot of people starting to face the fear of their pain and developing a desire to actually feel their pain 
and experience their pain and work through their pain rather than just avoiding it. That's how change is going to occur. Sense? So with regard to judgment, which was what started all this off, can you see that judgment is just a way of shutting yourself down? And many of us like it because it's an intellectual exercise we undertake so that we can avoid the emotion. We accept the judgment without any confrontation of the judgment because we want to shut down. The feeling inside of us is, I want to avoid my pain. Give me a reason. Give me a reason to avoid my pain. Oh, judgment. Bang. That, that is a reason. That's a valid reason I can use to avoid my pain, so I use it. Intellectual song and dances. Uh, a way to avoid my pain, so I use that. Getting my addictions met. A way to avoid my pain, so I use that. Right? Taking some pills. Doing physical substances to avoid my pain, so I use that. I'll do anything. Like... We are sluts when it comes to avoiding our pain, right? Do you know what I mean? You do anything for the sake of it, right? That's the reality, yeah? And, and this is what we've got to stop doing. We've got to stop going, oh, we've got to stop making the moral compromise, right? Every time we revert to judgment and allow the judgment to exist, 